ประกาศเล็กน้อยนะคะสำหรับท่านผู้เข้าร่วมฟังในวันนี้นะคะที่ยังไม่ได้ลงทะเบียนด้านหน้านะคะรบกวนไปสแกน QR code ลงทะเบียนก่อนนะคะ um, attention please for those who haven't registered for this conference kindly scan the QR code at the registration table please thank you
วัสดีเจ้าอ very good afternoon delegates distinguished guests ladies and gentlemen welcome to a special keynote lecture by professor Roger D Conberg the Nobel laureate for chemistry here at the Northern Sign Park Chiang Mai Thailand as you note on the screen this is the occasion to celebrate the, the 60th anniversary of Chiang Mai University we collaborate with the IPF or International Peace Foundation in arranging this activity. And it is Japan Asian Bridges event series. And of course, for our series, it is a privileged and great honor to have the presence of Professor Roger D. Conberg, the Nobel Laureate in Chemistry from the School of Medicine, Stanford University from the United States of America to give us the special lecture entitled The End of Disease, The Extraordinary Developments in Biomedicine and the Implications for Humanities. But first of all, I'd like to take this moment to invite Professor Dr. Pong Raksi Bandit Mongkon, the president of Chiang Mai University, to deliver the welcome remarks to the keynote speakers and all distinguished guests here, please. Students, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is with a profound honor and immense privilege that Chiang Mai University extends its most heartfelt welcome to the distinguished luminary Professor Roger D. Kornberg, Nobel Laureate for Chemistry, who graces us with his presence today. Professor Kornberg, your exceptional accomplishment in the realm of science, specifically your pioneering studies on the molecular intricacies of eukaryotic transcription have in indelibly shaped the landscape of molecular biology. The Prinzinger Nobel Prize in Chemistry bestowed upon you in 2006 stands testament to your groundbreaking work and unwavering dedication to unraveling the complexity of genetic information transfer within cellular frameworks. Your pursuit of knowledge and the meticulous atomic models you crafted have not only eliminated the mechanisms governing transcriptional processes, but have also paved the way for unprecedented adv advancement in our understanding of molecular biology. Your collaborative efforts spanning two decades alongside a cohort of 50, over 50 researchers at Stanford and across the globe have significantly contributed to delineating the, the <coughs> intricacy of eukaryotic transcription. Your seminal research on the structure of RNA polymerase II has served as a cornerstone for subsequent studies, propelling us towards a deeper comprehension of the roles played by transcription factors in the intricate web of transcriptional regulation. Professor Conberg, your presence here today serves as a beacon in, of inspiration for our students faculty members, and researchers alike. Chiang Mai University is profoundly grateful for the invaluable insight you will share through your enlightening lecture, which undoubtedly will ignite new vistas of scientific inquiry and learning. We, Chiang Mai University, and audiences in this room 
extend our deepest gratitude for gracing us with your wisdom and expertise. Thank you for honoring us with your presence at Chiang Mai University and Chiang Mai, Thailand. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your warm welcome speech. And next, may I invite Mr. Uwe Moravez, the founding chairman of International Peace Foundation to give the introductory remarks, please. Sawatikap and welcome to the Japan ASEAN Bridges event series facilitated by the Vienna-based International Peace Foundation. The events are hosted in cooperation with various local partners, including some of the country's major universities. And I would like to thank Chiang Mai University for hosting our event today. Commemorating the 50th anniversary of official relations between Japan and the ASEAN region, bridges will be continuously held in Thailand and Japan until March involving the participation of Nobel laureates for physics, chemistry, medicine, and economics. The Japan ASEAN Bridges series follows the series of over 800 bridges events, which the International Peace Foundation has facilitated since 2003 to support education in the ASEAN region. The pluralistic program of bridges highlights the International Peace Foundation's intercultural and transdisciplinary approach towards peace. The foundation doesn't take sides, but acts as a mediator by creating an independent platform for dialogue where representatives of science, politics, economy, culture, religion, the media, and youth can meet, share their viewpoints, listen to each other, and find mutual ways of understanding and cooperation. Therefore, the foundation itself is a bridge and a facilitator between different language groups in our divided societies where politicians speak another language than artists and business and religious leaders, another one than scientists. In a highly interdependent world, problems cannot be solved by either one of these language groups only, but by working together. The aim of Bridges is to facilitate and strengthen dialogue and communication between societies in Asia with their multiple cultures and faiths, as well as with peoples in other, world, uh, other parts of the world to promote understanding and trust. The events aim at building bridges with local universities in Asia to establish long-term relationships with Nobel laureates in all fields, which result in common research programs and other forms of collaboration. By enhancing science, technology, and education as a basis for peace and development, the events may lead to a better advancement of peace, freedom, and security in the region with the active involvement of the young generation, our key to the future. This is why Bridges is not designed as a one-time event, but as a continuous process of synergies of now over two decades to make the series of events a sustainable success for Thailand and for Asia as a whole. I'm grateful to our honorary chairman, Anand Banyalachun, and to our partners and sponsors who have enabled us to make Bridges a reality. I would like Thank you, everyone present today for taking part in this program. May it help us to facilitate a new culture of peace through dialogue, transcending its definition as merely the absence of war or armed conflict into a new understanding what the basis for peace is, education. In this spirit, we welcome today the 2006 Nobel Laureate for Chemistry, Professor Roger Kornberg, who has again agreed to come to Thailand to support the events. We all look forward to his keynote speech and to his important contribution to build bridges. Thank you very much for your introduction. 
Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, as I mentioned, this is one of the historic moments of Chiang Mai University. So we are going to capture the moment. May I ask all of you to stand up because we are going to have a group photo shoot. The photographer on the stage, please. We are going to do the selfie shot. So kindly stand up, please. Stand up, please. We, are, we would love to have everyone in the flame. We would love to have everyone, every one of you. So this is one of the truly amazing moments. So the photographer on the stage, please. So let's do the selfie shot. Of course, ladies and gentlemen, if it's possible, kindly move uh, toward the center. Then we can capture, then we can have everyone in the flame. We don't want to leave anyone behind. We would love to have all of you to join the flame and capture this historic moment. All right, photographer, you can give them the signal. So which one first? Which camera first? Which camera first? Okay, okay. In the center, please. All right, smile, smile, please. This is truly the amazing moment and one of the historic moments. All right. Thank you so very much. Oh, oh, one more post, one more post, I'm sorry. So to mark the success of this lecture. So let's do the yay post, yay. Thank you very much. And this is the true celebration of the 60th anniversary of Chiang Mai University. Thank you very much, photographers. And please be seated. Thank you so very much. All right. I think this is the time to here from our Nobel laureates. So while, um, okay, we are waiting, let, allow me to introduce our keynote speaker for today. Even, um, even Mr. Uwe, the chairperson of IPF and the chairman of Chiang Mai, and I'm sorry, the president of Chiang Mai University have already mentioned about our Nobel laureate a little bit, but allow me to give you the information and his bibliography more. Professor Kornberg won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 2006 for his research on the molecular basis of eukaryotic transcription. His prize-winning research focuses on the process by which DNA is converted into RNA, known as transcription, it enables genetic information to be transferred to the different parts of the body, a process that is crucial for organism survival. Problems in transcription contribute to a number of illnesses, including cancer and also the heart disease. And his studies reviewed how transcription works at the molecular level for eukaryote, a group of organisms that includes mammals. And as I told you earlier, his topic today is the end of disease with question mark and the extraordinary developments in biomedicine and the implication for humanities. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome him with a big round of applause.
Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I'm pleased to speak with you today about science in general and more specifically in about the first half of the lecture about the history leading up to the science that I myself have done and what it portends uh, for discovery in the future. After that, in the latter part of the lecture, I'll talk about the application of those discoveries. I'll give some examples of applications to important problems. Discovery takes a long time. Often the applications are also only appreciated years after. But one of my many uh, distinguished uh, predecessors remarked, all science is applied. It is only a matter of time. Or another way to put it, there are only two kinds of science, applied science and not yet applied science. So I will tell you at the beginning about discovery and then applied science at the end. Uh, I like to begin by borrowing from a wonderful lecture that I heard given uh, quite some years ago by Professor Paul Nurse, a British molecular biologist who won the Nobel Prize also many years ago for his discovery of the basis for the cell cycle, the process of cell growth, division to produce daughter cells, and then repetition of the process. Uh, the title of Paul Nurse's lecture was Great Ideas in Biology, uh, which may seem like a contradiction in terms in as much as we think of physics as the science of ideas and biology an empirical science. Nevertheless, there have been great ideas and they form the basis for the biological science and in particular applications to medicine that we do today. The first of the great ideas in science, in biology, I should say, that Paul Nurse identified was the idea of the cell. The cell is the unit of life, the unit of all life, from single cells to multicellular organisms. There are a hundred trillion cells in a human, and important for what I will mention later on, 200 different types of cells in a human. Cells were discovered by Anthony van Leeuwenhoek in the 17th century. Leeuwenhoek was a tradesperson of no special education who became interested in grinding lenses and viewing objects at high magnification. He discovered viewing blood, viewing water from various sources, uh, ponds, sea, and what have you, the existence of microbes. He discovered blood cells, sperm cells. He founded the subject of microbiology. Uh, in this image, you see on the other side, a famous painting by Johannes Vermeer, uh, one of the notable artists of that century. The uh, painting itself is titled The Astronomer, but in fact, it's thought to be an image of Leeuwenhoek himself, who served as the ex executor of Vermeer's estate, a close friend who then looked after uh, Vermeer's uh, estate following his passing. The second great idea in biology, well known, I think, to all of you, the idea of the gene. And as many of you will be aware, uh, discovered by Gregor Mendel, an Augustinian monk, uh, more than a century later, Mendel, uh, walking in the monastery garden, noticed multiple varieties of an ornamental plant. And uh, he asked the question whether the characteristics of one could be passed to another. He planted them next to each other and found that they bred true they retained the characteristics of their parents. On this basis, he discovered the existence of heredity, and he went on then to investigate the transmission of traits uh, between parents of uh, the identical species and discovered the laws of heredity, the exact numerical ratios by which traits are transferred. 
Mendel published his work in the late, in the latter part of the 19th century. It was uh, forgotten and only rediscovered at the beginning of the 20th century uh, and formed the basis for the emergence of the field of genetics. The last of these great ideas in biology that I'll mention by way of introduction, the idea of life as chemistry, the idea uh, that all living things can be understood in every aspect in chemical terms. And this we attribute to the great French chemist uh, Pasteur. Pasteur along with Robert Koch in Germany are credited with the idea, the discovery, uh, the a promulgation of the germ theory of disease. Uh, this was, of course, enormous of enormous importance for many reasons. It led very soon to uh, Lister introducing antiseptic surgery. Uh, in the case of Pasteur, he recognized that microbes were the cause of spoilage of beverages. Uh, this, in the case of milk, led to heating it to extend the life of milk, a process which to this day is called pasteurization. When the French wine industry uh, was in distress uh, and the quality of wine and its production for a period of time uh, in decline, uh, Pasteur was sought as an advisor. He recognized that microbes were again involved, that it was yeast that were responsible for the fermentation process uh, and the generation of wine, fermentation referring to the conversion of sugar to alcohol in the production of wine and of course other alcoholic beverages. Pasteur then asked the great question of his age, what is life? It's easy to appreciate the difference between a living and an inanimate, a non-living thing. Everyone can perceive that without difficulty, but what makes something alive? This was the question. Pasteur asked, is the quality of life, the, of living, something which is inseparable from the living thing, or is there a component inside the living cell, the living object, uh, that is responsible, something uh, deeper inside that could be discovered as the basis. What, it was asked, is the vital force of life? To answer the question, Pasteur simply broke open the yeast and asked, can the contents of yeast ferment? Can the contents of yeast convert sugar to alcohol? And uh, remarkably for the history of science, setting it back many, many decades, Pasteur came to the wrong conclusion he found that the contents of the yeast that he broke open would not cause fermentation. They would not convert sugar to alcohol. And he concluded that life is something inherent in the living thing and inseparable from, from, from a living cell. It was only many years later that Eduard Buchner repeated the experiment with the opposite result. He discovered when he broke open yeast that the contents would convert sugar to alcohol. That led to the discovery of the vital force that it resides in protein catalysts that convert sugar to alcohol, and in fact are responsible for every process in every living thing in every aspect of life. Enzymes are the vital force. For this, uh, Buchner won the Nobel Prize, one of the first Nobel Prizes in medicine or physiology in 1905. Buchner, in fact, remarked that when he found that result, he couldn't believe it. The influence of Pasteur was so great that he at first refused to accept the result of his own experiment, but it was ultimately inescapable. Now, what I will uh, speak to you about in the next few minutes concerns uh, an aspect of my own research that was mentioned in the introduction and uh, leads to what I will have to tell you later. So I will speak to you about genes and life as chemistry. I will speak to you briefly about genetic chemistry. Well, most of you know that genes are made of DNA. And you know that, almost all of you know that DNA is described as a double helix, which refers to two 
strands of individual building blocks wound around each other in helical form. The information, all of the information for the form and function of every living thing resides in its DNA. In fact, every cell of every organism, every cell of our bodies contains the complete DNA, the entire instructions for the form and function of we as humans or any other living thing. But the DNA itself is silent. It serves for the purpose of heredity. It serves for the purpose discovered by Mendel, that is for the transmission of information, the complete genetic information from one generation to the next for the utilization of that information, for the process we call gene expression. In the life of a living thing, we require copying from DNA into RNA, a molecule of very similar structure, also a very long thin molecule. In the case of RNA, only one strand instead of two wound about in a double helix as in DNA. The process, uh, whereby the information is copied from DNA into RNA goes by the appropriate term in the English language, transcription. Many of you will know that transcribing refers to copying. The enzyme that is responsible for transcription also goes by an understandable name, RNA, because that is the product, polymerase, because RNA is a long polymer. RNA polymerase is responsible for copying the genetic information from DNA into RNA. The RNA is called messenger RNA. Well, many of you will have heard by now of messenger RNA because it is the key component of modern vaccines, the ones that were first introduced for uh, protection against SARS-CoV-2 during the pandemic and will be used to produce other vaccines in the future. The last step of gene expression is from the information in RNA to make the enzymes, which I told you are the vital force. That is the process whereby the genetic code in DNA and RNA is translated into the sequence of building blocks of a protein. The RNA polymerase, as I mentioned, copies information from one strand of the DNA. What is indicated here in blue is the single strand of RNA that is made by an exact match to the genetic information in DNA. The proteins like DNA, like RNA, consist of very long chains of building blocks. Proteins have the special capacity to coil up in a unique manner in a compact structure. And it is that very precise organization of the building blocks of the protein in the folded form that endows them with the catalytic capability of enzymes. Now, RNA polymerase is made up of not one, but multiple protein molecules, a dozen in the case of polymerase. But even with that level of complexity, it is not alone capable of transcription from DNA to RNA. It requires many additional protein molecules. Uh, we discovered these over the course of two decades of research at Stanford University through work of many talented students, postdoctoral fellows and other colleagues. We found 25 proteins of the so-called general factors, all essential for transcription. And beyond that, another 20 proteins of a separate assembly that we refer to as mediator, whose significance I'll come to in a moment. This entire group of nearly 60 proteins with a mass of 3 million mass units is required for every round of copying genetic information by, from every gene in every organism from a single cell like a yeast to a complex multicellular creature like a human. I'll just comment briefly about one interesting general factor whose role may fascinate you. And then I'll comment about the importance of mediator before I go on. So the general factor uh, that I will single out for discussion 
plays an important and unanticipated role, not in transcription, but also in DNA repair. It is a multifunctional protein, as I say, essential for transcription, but also for a repair of damage to DNA. Damage comes about from many sources, from radiation, uh, from chemicals in the environment, uh, from the oxygen in our environment. You will be astonished to learn that there are two quintillion lesions to your DNA every day from sources such as these. It takes only two mutations to cause cancer. So the repair machinery must be so effective that it will eliminate almost all, if not every single one of these mutations every day of our lives. One of the general factors we discovered turned out to be the machinery responsible for DNA repair. So not only essential for life to copy genetic information, but also essential to protect our lives against damage to our DNA from the environment. The other component, essential component of the transcription machinery that I'll comment on briefly is the mediator. Recall I mentioned that every cell of your body contains the complete genetic information. But I told you at the beginning, there are 200 different types of cells. There are nerve cells, muscle cells, blood cells, skin cells, 200 different types. How is it possible that there, the complete information is present in every cell, but the remarkable differentiation in of cell types takes place. And the answer, of course, is the selectivity of transcription, the capacity in the presence of mediator to transcribe only the information required in a cell of a particular type. Mediator is a kind of molecular computer. We found that it responds to signals coming from inside the cell, signals coming from elsewhere in the body, and signals coming from the environment. It has the remarkable capacity to process all of that information and then deliver a, an instruction to RNA polymerase, what gene to transcribe it at what place in the body, at what time, and in what quantity. So mediator it performs the essential function for the development of a multicellular organism. And again, this is a role which is universal. So transcription was discovered, I should say all of our research was done by isolation of the proteins that I've mentioned from yeast. But everything that I have told you applies in a precise detail to every living thing. It applies to microorganisms like yeast, but it also applies equally to every higher organism, including plants, and animals. Mediator in plants controls flowering. Mediator in our cells not only controls cell differentiation, but it is mutations in mediator proteins that are the basis for most cancers. Mediator then is a prime target for cancer therapy. The discovery of mediator then tells us about the direction to pursue in the development of drugs uh, for the remediation or even the cure of cancer. I think it worth emphasizing what is indicated in this slide. Many, indeed, I would argue all of the important discoveries that form the basis for modern medicine, all made during the past century, have come about in a similar manner to what I have described. They have come about through the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake. None of the great discoveries, antibiotics, genetic engineering, gene editing, or any of the other important fundamental basis, the pillars of modern medicine, uh, was discovered by trying to solve the problem directly. Rather, what the lesson of the last century teaches us not only in medicine, but in every field. If you wish to solve a challenging problem that cannot be done with existing means, do not try and do so directly, but rather pursue a curiosity about nature. 
and ultimately a discovery will be made and the solution to the problem will emerge. Now, I commented at the beginning about uh, the difference, but also the similarity, the relationship between fundamental science, such as I have uh, described to this point, and applied science. And I'd like in the remainder of the lecture uh, to offer just a few examples of recent applications of science, of basic science that I believe will be of interest to you. I'll comment on uh, three or in three categories. The first uh, concerns a cause of disease that most of us are even unaware of. So it turns out that particulate air pollution, PM 2.5, small particles, two and a half microns in diameter, are actually the greatest threat to human health. They are the cause of more disease than any other aspect of life or our environment. So what this slide tells you is that uh, just a couple of years ago, pollution, air pollution by PM 2.5s caused more than 4 million deaths worldwide. Now, you may think of PM 2.5s, particulate air pollution as arising primarily from combustion. But in fact, the greatest concentration of these small particles is inside the home, arising from cooking, from hair drying, from vacuum cleaning, from other such ordinary processes. So PM 2.5 pollution is the leading risk factor in our environment. We can't always prevent it. We have to cook, we have to clean, but we can be made aware of it and, and avoid it. And that is because of an innovation made uh, that I will tell you about now very briefly, software that can be incorporated in any cell phone using only the existing capabilities of your phone, only the existing audio and visual capabilities of your phone and enable accurate detection of the concentration of PM 2.5s in the air surrounding you. So this is the basis of what we call a personal environmenter, something which uh, is made possible by a software recently discovered, recently developed that can be incorporated in any smartphone. It doesn't only detect PM 2.5s, it can measure accurately the temperature, the humidity, uh, exposure to UV and other dangerous influences. This is a list, if you can read it, of the accuracy, which is really impressive. So temperature to within a degree, ask yourself, how can your cell phone measure the temperature using only its audio and its visual capabilities? Well, that is what the software can do. And then in the case of uh, PM 2.5 particles, it can measure AQI, air quality index, within the bracket that is important for the protection of human health. The kind of data that can be collected in this way when such software is installed on millions, perhaps even billions of cell phones, will have an added value when it is made available, available for analysis by machine learning and other methods. It will allow, of course, uh, governments to uh, better direct city planning, and it will allow doctors to better appreciate the nature of the risk of uh, inherent susceptibilities and possible ways of alleviating uh, the problem. I'll turn now to another area of application, and that is the development of drugs, small molecules in the first case, and then later I'll tell you about large molecule drugs. Well, small molecule of drugs are the kind we're mostly familiar with. They are the constituent, the active ingredient of the pills that we swallow. The most famous, one of the first small molecule drugs, of course, penicillin, the, the antibiotic, which transformed human health in a way which probably will never be surpassed for the extent to which it saved lives from infectious disease. Well, what this slide indicates is that the pharmaceutical industry has made an increasing investment indicated by the vertical bars, but the red line shows that the, pr these, the productivity in terms of new drugs has actually declined. And the reason is because the way these molecules work, they are small molecules that insert themselves in a cavity of 
a larger target, that target being, in most cases, an enzyme. They work, they function like what we call in English a cog in the works. They bind and they interfere with the function of the enzyme. The difficulty is current means of discovering small molecules for new targets, for example, the components of the mediator that are the basis when mutated of cancer in very many cases. The current means allows testing of as many as a million different chemicals to try and find one that fits into the protein target to interfere with its function. Well, it turns out that a million molecules is not enough to find one that is both effective on the one hand and does not also interact with some other essential enzyme in the body and cause side effects that may that are the basis of toxicity and may prevent its use as a drug. So what we really need is to test not a million, but a million, million molecules. An ingenious way of doing that was discovered, was conceived of about 20 years ago and has now come into use. So in the past, a million molecules could be tested by robotic means. The robots in pharmaceutical companies to test a million molecules for action against a particular target, usually an enzyme, would fill a room this size. They cost a billion dollars and they cost hundreds of million dollars every year to maintain and operate. The method that I will tell you about now is accomplished in a small test tube, takes only a matter of minutes, and it can test not a million, but a million, million molecules, and it almost invariably identifies a very attractive starting point for pharmaceutical, for drug development. And I'll just explain in a word how this is done. It is due to uh, an idea from uh, a great molecular biologist, biologist Sidney Brenner, and another a renowned scientist, Richard Lerner, at the Scripps Institute in San Diego. So the way it is done is a process in which the potential drug molecule is built from small pieces, from parts. And the parts are symbolized here by an orange circle, a blue triangle, a green square, and Usually there are at least a dozen components and they're assembled in a random order. But the important point is that when each one is added, a very small piece of DNA is appended. The order in which they are added is in effect recorded in the order of those small pieces of DNA. After a mixture is made, of great complexity, it can contain a million, million different molecules, then the product, the mixture, is allowed to interact with the target protein. The target protein is withdrawn from the solution with whichever member of that entire set was associated. And finally, recent advances in determining the nuclei, the, the sequence of components of a DNA molecule make it possible to read the sequence of the chemical components in the active molecule. It is as simple as that. And the chemical in, the pharmaceutical industry has been transformed. All of the devices, the billion dollar devices for robotic detection have been mothballed. They are out of use. And every chemical company, to every pharmaceutical company today employs this powerful approach for new drug discovery. And it is an approach introduced uh, and begun to be widely used only in the last couple of years. And it has already produced dramatic success in the development of new drugs. The last topic that I'd like to speak to uh, concerns not small molecule drugs, but large molecule drugs, not chemicals that are synthesized and that are in some way artificial in the most case, but natural small molecules, large molecules, DNA, RNA, and proteins used as drugs. Now, this was never possible in the past because small molecules 
are able to enter our cells, but large molecules cannot. Large molecules cannot cross the barrier, the membrane, the envelope, uh, the wall that surrounds every living cell. Only small molecules can penetrate. And that is why all drugs in the past were small molecule drugs. I'll tell you in a moment how the problem of penetration of large molecules was solved. Large molecules are very attractive as drugs because they, uh, in the first place, they are programmed. We don't need to discover them by a search because we can read the sequence of components from nature. Also, unlike small molecule chemical drugs, which may have side effects because they are not completely specific and can contact other components in the body, DNA, RNA, and proteins were evolved for absolute specificity. They were evolved to serve one purpose and no, have no other effect in the body. Now, for the application to the problem of pandemic preparedness, I wish to emphasize the importance uh, of this approach. There have been four pandemics due to flu alone in the last century, and all of you are well aware of uh, the most recent pandemic due to coronavirus. In the case of flu, there's great concern at this very moment about uh, a pandemic, the next pandemic that may arise because of an H5N1 bird flu, which in the few cases that it has so far passed into humans has caused a nearly 60% mortality rate. Great concern in the medical community about the possibility that this particular bird flu will undergo a single mutation that will allow its, its free transmission uh, uh, amongst uh, humans. So the solutions at the present time uh, to the problem of pandemic development are both small molecules and vaccines. Uh, you're aware of small molecule drugs for flu like Tamiflu. Uh, you probably heard of Paxlovid for coronavirus. And uh, you're uh, aware, of course, of the importance of vaccines. Uh, the problem is that vaccines take a long time to develop. If a new virus appears, it will be many months before a vaccine has been made to protect us against that virus. And then in the present uh, version of those vaccines, such as are available, uh, the mechanism employed to deliver them to human cells and solve the problem of entry into the cells is very is, is an awkward and impractical one. It imposes a requirement, as probably you know, for ultra cold, cold storage. Once the vaccines are taken out of storage, the half-life is very short. They must be delivered by injection. And then there are other problems that arise. There are many people who are afraid to be vaccinated. There are people in parts of the world where vaccines are simply unavailable. Uh, in much of the third world, in Africa, for example, uh, it has been a serious problem even making this kind of protection available against the coronavirus. What I'll tell you about is one example of a, an RNA drug different from a messenger RNA vaccine, uh, which does afford a solution to the problem. It is, I believe, the unique solution to the problem of future pandemic preparedness. Um, this RNA molecule is called a small interfering RNA, small because it is only 25 units long, as opposed to a messenger RNA and a vaccine, which will be many thousands of units long. It is an interfering RNA because unlike messenger RNA, which we have studied, as I have told you, in regard to its mechanism of production, the small interfering RNA is concerned with destruction of RNA. It has the capacity when introduced in cells uh, to destroy any RNA within the cell that is a match of the genetic code. So a small interfering RNA that contains a bit of the genetic code of a virus, when introduced into an infected cell, will seek out, discover a match to the RNA of the virus, 
and that will lead to its destruction. This is a natural mechanism. It's present in every cell of our bodies. Now, I alluded to the problem of entry into cells. So a classical drug, I told you the first example, the best known one, penicillin, a small molecule that's shown on the left here, 300 mass units. Small interfering RNA, an example of a large molecule drug, in this case, 25 uh, genetic units long, is 50 times larger, 50 times greater in mass. And moreover, unlike the small molecule, which is electrically neutral, which facilitates its entry into cells, RNA, DNA, proteins are electrically charged, which absolutely prevents passage into cells, except through the the mechanism through the process that was discovered recently uh, that I will now briefly, that I'll just briefly describe. So I told you that a small interfering RNA, a so-called siRNA, because of its size and because of its electrical charge, cannot cross the cell membrane barrier. What we, what we have found is by attaching a derivative of cholesterol, a well-known, perfectly safe, uh, common component of our bodies to both ends of the small RNA, it will now freely penetrate. It will pass rapidly across the membrane of any living cell. Once inside the cell, because of the mode of attachment, the cholesterol moiety, the cholesterol component is released. The small interfering RNA, RNA is trapped inside the cell to exert its effect, which as I have again explained, discovering a match anywhere in the cell to an RNA with the same genetic code leading to its destruction. Here is just one example of how well it works. Here the small interfering RNA was labeled with a red dye. And without the attachment of the cholesterol derivative, you see on the left, there was no penetration of cells. But on the right-hand side, uh, every melanoma cell in this experiment became entirely filled with the red dye labeled small interfering RNA. Now here is a test that was performed to evaluate the efficacy of a small RNA with the genetic code of SARS-CoV-2 for the treatment of, of COVID. So the experiment was performed on monkeys. And so the importance of the use of a non-human primate for such a study is because the animals commonly used for testing drugs, rats, mice, dogs, what have you, uh, differ somewhat in their respiratory system from humans. But primates are virtually identical. And any analysis, any test that is performed in primates is assuredly directly transferable to humans. So in this case, the African green monkey was infected with SARS-CoV-2 and the number of copies of virus in a nasal swab of the monkey was measured over a series of days, one, two, four, six days. The vertical blue bars show you the level of virus in the monkeys that were not treated with the small interfering RNA um, weaponized uh, with the cholesterol derivative attached. The light blue bars uh, show the results of treatment with the drug that I have mentioned, small interfering RNA bearing two molecules of a cholesterol derivative. And you see by day, by the sixth day, there you, uh, we find a Three log, that is a thousand fold reduction in the level of virus. 99.9% .9 of the virus has been eliminated from the system. This is to be contrasted with the only available drug, which is Paxlovid, which causes only a one log reduction. It only removes 90% of the virus. As soon as the drug is withdrawn, the disease comes back. On the other hand, a 99.9% .9 reduction, we know from the only other case of curing any viral disease, which is hepatitis C, the drug for that purpose <coughs> introduced a few years ago, sofosbuvir, 
also produces a 99.9%, .9%, a three log reduction, and it cures the disease. So assuredly, uh, this result portends the effective cure in a short period of time of infection with SARS-CoV-2. There are many advantages to such a drug. Uh, in other experiments, we first treated the monkey with the drug and then exposed it to the virus. The monkeys in no case were infected by the virus. So the drug is, preve is preventative, it's protective. We call it prophylactic as well as therapeutic. This drug is stable indefinitely at room temperature and can be formulated even as a dry powder and then redissolved for the purpose of use. And most importantly, it is delivered by inhalation, not by injection. In fact, because of the mechanism that I told you whereby it is trapped in the cell that it enters, when inhaled, it enters only the cells of the first layer in the respiratory system, those that line the respiratory tract. It never enters the body as a whole, so it is even a topical drug it is not only safe because it is a natural molecule, but is especially safe because it never enters the body, but it achieves perfect protection. Because it is delivered by inhalation and there's no requirement for a medical professional, a doctor or a nurse or what have you to inoculate, uh, that represents another enormous advantage for general use. Small interfering RNA is made automatically on a machine. It is not a complicated process, no expensive chemical synthesis. Treatment with a drug costs a dollar. And then the last point, which uh, I think is worth bearing in mind, this approach is not limited to SARS-CoV-2. It's applicable to every virus. In particular, readily applicable to all 23 common human respiratory viruses. And I often point out, you will learn from uh, doctors in general practice that most of the patients who come into their clinics complain of respiratory symptoms, usually flu or something of the kind. The cost in human suffering is great. The cost in economic terms, perhaps even greater, all could be eliminated by this approach. So I think it... Uh, it appropriate to conclude by contrasting the benefits of small RNA drugs with RNA vaccines and along the lines that I've already mentioned, but I think it bears repetition. So I've told you that RNA vaccines, well, you all know that they take many months to develop for a new virus, but such a, a small RNA drug for any new virus can be made literally overnight. As soon as a new virus appears, the genome sequence may be determined within hours. The sequence of that virus punched into the machine to make a small interfering RNA, and literally overnight, the drug is available. In the case of RNA vaccines, when every new variant requires production of a new vaccine, but in the case of small interfering RNA, we can choose a region of the genome of the RNA that never varies. There are such regions because if any change occurs there, the virus itself cannot multiply, cannot function, cannot perform its role. In the case of the SARS-CoV-2 drug that I mentioned, that one drug that we've made, we've already shown is effective against every variant of SARS-CoV-2 SARS -CoV that has so far arisen. I've already commented, this is a drug that is stable at room temperature, um, and so is readily distributed widely around the world. Self-administered uh, by inhalation, as I've told you, a single inhalation achieves an instantaneous effect. A vaccine, when you receive it, only confers immunity after a period of weeks as your, natural, as your immune system develops and responds. When you inhale the drug that I have mentioned, you are protected at that moment perfectly from the virus. Vaccines are, in some cases, uh, highly effective, in other cases less so. Most flu vaccines about 50% effective. That is to say, half of people who are vaccinated do not gain protection. 
especially in older people whose immune systems are less effective, uh, the, uh, the efficacy is lower. And at best, very good vaccines will protect 80 to 90% of the population. But I've already told you that this small interfering drug is literally 100% effective, 99.9% .9 elimination of the virus. And then I eliminate, I, lastly, I commented that it is a topical drug. It doesn't enter the body. One of the problems in the United States and probably in other parts of the world, many people are afraid to be vaccinated. And so a significant fraction of the population will even uh, refuse to receive that form of protection against disease and ultimately uh, the pandemic spread is unavoidable for that, if not all of the other reasons. So with that, let me finally comment that this is an approach applicable not only to viral disease, it's applicable to every disease causing, path causing pathogen. It's readily applicable to neurological degenerative disease. We are currently developing a version of a small interfering RNA that I believe will be the first effective Alzheimer's drug. And all indications from the laboratory experiments done thus far, it should, when symptoms of Alzheimer's are detected, even at a very early stage, prevent any further progress of the disease. Um, it will be a highly effective approach to cancer therapy for the reason that I told you, that cancer arises from mutation. And one can readily produce a small RNA which recognizes the sequence of that muted, mutated form of a gene. There's even the possibility that we will one day understand the molecular basis of aging. Uh, and if uh, that, if, if uh, the prevention of aging is deemed desirable, it may be present, prevented as well. It won't happen in my lifetime, but in the but many of the young students in the audience may look forward to immortality. And on that happy note, I thank you for your attention. <laughs> thank you very much. And I'd like to take this moment for the Q&A session. If you have any question at all, please raise your hand and then the microphone will be served right to your seat. And, so, if, and anyone who wants to ask a question in Thai language, please do so and our moderator will kindly translate. I'll try my best. <laughs> um, the staff, um, the microphone, Oh, over there, please. All the young people in the audience to ask questions about the content of this lecture or about anything else that you would like to do about science or what have you. So, so. don't be bashful. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your very um, nice talk today. Very um, inspiring. Um, my very first question would be like, RNAs are notoriously known for their instability, right? Like they get degraded easily. Um, how did you overcome this issue when you turn it into a drug? Like when it gets administered, why doesn't it get chopped up? Or if we were to use it in a different form as an oral drug, um, if it goes into the GI tract, then of course you have so many gastric contents, all the pH and stuff. Would it degrade this if there's a way to overcome that as well? Thank you. So the question concerns the stability of RNA. And it's, a, it's an, a very important question because RNA is designed by nature to be unstable. In order for cells to be able to respond to changing conditions or to differentiate into other types, it is necessary for the RNA at one stage in the life of the cell to be replaced by a different composition of RNA appropriate to the environmental change or to the new cell type that is evolved, that is uh, developed through differentiation. So RNA is designed by nature to be unstable. It can have a very short half-life. The way in which that problem can be addressed both for the purpose of the drug that I described and uh, for the interesting uh, possibility in the future, which I believe we will uh, almost certainly do, uh, 
RNA drugs that are orally bioavailable that don't need to be uh, inhaled or perhaps injected, but can actually be uh, simply consumed like a pill. The way in which that problem is solved is by changing the chemical nature of the RNA itself. So RNA is unstable because the linkages between its many building blocks are readily broken down. In fact, the fundamental difference between RNA and DNA is only the change of a single oxygen molecule, which in the case of DNA, which is deoxy, meaning it lacks that oxygen, renders the DNA stable, which you would want for the genetic material, and an RNA that does include that oxygen, unstable. Well, so we can readily uh, render RNA stable by simple chemistry, changing the linkages. That is commonly done, and uh, the means are already known. And indeed, the RNA that we made in the drug that we delivered to monkeys was rendered stable in that manner. In fact, the respiratory tract contains a great abundance of the enzyme that degrades RNA. So it was absolutely essential for us to make the drug in a form that would be resistant to break down by that enzyme which is what we've done. So one simply changes the nature of the bond between the building blocks of the RNA to achieve stability uh, for the purpose that I've mentioned, ultimately for the purpose of oral delivery of the drug. All right, seems like uh, we have one more question here, please. I would like to connect to that other question. You mentioned that um, the uh, your treatment only affects the first, the outermost layer of the cells in, in the case of the respiratory vaccine. How would you uh, then convert this in order to treat neurodegenerative diseases? Because you have a rather big problem to overcome with a blood brain barrier. Exactly. So. I mentioned that the small interfering RNA upon entry in a cell uh, is separated from the cholesterol-like molecules that enable its passage across the cell membrane. That is because they are connected through a bond which is broken down readily inside the cell. Uh, that was important for a small interfering RNA because it could not exert its function with those molecules of a cholesterol-like derivative attached. However, another approach, uh, well-known, uh, actually older than the use of small interfering RNA, called antisense, uh, can readily be employed. In this case, uh, the, the, the target is again an RNA molecule inside the cell. The antisense strand is commonly a DNA molecule. When the DNA recognizes in the same way as a small interfering RNA, a target of the same genetic code, it interacts in the same manner as a small interfering RNA, but the product is not an RNA to RNA double strand, but an RNA to DNA double strand. So every cell contains highly active machinery for recognizing RNA, DNA double strands and destroying the RNA as a result. So for the purpose of the Alzheimer's drug that we're developing, in fact, we're not making a small interfering RNA. We're making a single strand of DNA that will match the genetic code of one of any one of many possible targets in the case of Alzheimer's. There's uh, one that we have begun with that has been shown in laboratory experiments uh, to be especially sensitive and essential for the uh, development, for the progression of the disease, and who's uh, knocked down, that is to say, uh, lowering an amount will prevent progression. Uh, there are, in fact, uh, quite some number of, ge of, of genes that are potential targets for Alzheimer's, and we may ultimately want to tackle, make a combination and attack not one but several. But the answer to your question 
In those cases, we will use a linkage to the cholesterol derivative, which does not break down inside the cell, as a result of which the drug could be orally bioavailable because it will pass freely across every cell membrane barrier. When swallowed, it will pass through intestinal cells. It'll enter the bloodstream. It'll pass out of the bloodstream. It'll pass everywhere readily because of the capacity of that cholesterol-like molecule to facilitate the free penetration of a molecule even as large as small interfering RNA or the corresponding size of DNA strand into cells. Okay, I see. So in essence, you would be saturating, you would be delivering enough uh, antisense RNA to pass uh, basically so that enough of it passes into the target cells, even though they basically distribute all over the body. So every drug uh, that you are familiar with is delivered or distributed in the body in the same manner. Uh, there are almost no examples of targeted small molecule drugs. Every pill that you take, um, you require a sufficient amount to achieve a concentration throughout the body that it will uh, then have the desired effect at the target, which could be an infection in some part of the body, or it could be uh, some, some function generation of stomach acid, uh, the production of cholesterol in the liver, statins for that, uh, these drugs, uh, the inhibitors of acid production in the stomach, they all have a single location where they exert their effect, but the drugs that we take distribute throughout the body, uh, which is one of the reasons why those drugs can often have side effects. Um, it's the advantage of these nucleic acid molecules that they are so highly specific that even if they are distributed throughout the body, they will only work in one place. Nevertheless, we can actually target the nucleic acid drugs. Uh, and I could explain in more detail how that will be done, but it's a, a, a virtual certainty that uh, the, the second generation of these molecules will be targeted to the tissue. Uh, for example, the brain, uh, where we most want them to concentrate and perform their function. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And any other question? Young please? people. Young students. people. <laughs> oh my goodness. You know, you have to not be afraid to ask about anything you want yeah, to know. Exactly. Okay. The president, young people, the youngest here. <laughs> and when you say young people, you should ask the question. <laughs> so I stand up. You're younger than I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in first of all, I would like to thank the uh, professor. Uh, convert to to uh, give us an overview of uh, microbiology and it's very really, uh, long journey you start from uh, 17th 18th century mm -hmm. until now but it's give us a uh, more uh, and uh, more under understood about the, the uh, cell biology and compared to up to now, when you're talking about the small interfering, interfering uh, RNA, which is will be the new uh, uh, knowledge that we can we can produce the new drugs, right? So my question is, uh, how many new drugs gonna come out under this uh, small RNA is uh, on the pipeline, and? If this is a uh, is, is, uh, uh, widely used uh, techniques to produce the new drugs, so it's gonna change, it's gonna change the uh, pharmaceutical industry in the future. You know, you may know that this uh, very uh, uh, expensive uh, uh, industry, and also it will change the drug discovery, the, the drug, the new drug uh, uh, production or discovery. Uh, as well. So by another way, if this uh, happened well, uh, widely used uh, techniques, the new drug should be cheaper. So in other words, many people can access these uh, new drugs uh, easily. So my question is, first is how many uh, in the pipeline and you're going to change the uh, uh, pharmaceutical 
industry. So they're going to love you a lot. <laughs> so both parts of your question are really important. I mean, I'll come to the second part first. The democratization of pharmaceutical development and drug therapy. There's just no question that if we can produce drugs that cost much less, both to develop and to distribute, uh, it will be uh, transformational for human health. Now, the, the lower cost is for the reason that I mentioned, uh, that the lower cost of, uh, of production, of distribution. But the lower cost of development is also important. The reason why drugs cost so much to develop today is because the clinical trials are so expensive. The, the drugs cost perhaps some tens of millions of dollars. The chemicals that were commonly produced as drugs, some tens of millions of dollars, the work of many chemists and so forth, but tens of millions of dollars. But the trials, the clinical trials cost hundreds of millions of dollars. It, 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 th there is almost no a molecule, small molecule introduced on the market that costs less than a billion dollars uh, to bring to market. And that is because the drugs are not very effective. And so the clinical trials have to be conducted on very large numbers of people to get statistically significant results. I'm sorry, let me turn this off. Uh, to get, to get statistically significant results. And in the case of cancer drugs, often the statistics are really very questionable. There can be a very small difference. The drug may extend life for only a matter of months. And to demonstrate that convincingly requires studies on large numbers of people. These drugs are so effective. We believe, for example, with the SARS-CoV-2 drug that we're now introducing into trials, we won't need to perform a trial on many tens of thousands of people over a long period of time. We're pretty sure that a few hundred people will be sufficient because every person <laughs> that is treated will uh, be protected in the way the trial will be done. It will, of course, be prophylactic. We'll uh, uh, expose people to the drug. And then because the virus is very common today, uh, in a matter of weeks from a few hundred people, we'll find quite some number that develop the disease, but I believe none of the people who are protected will suffer from the disease. So the cost of the trial will be very, very small. That should be true for most of these drugs because of their high level of effectiveness. They employ a natural mechanism that works every time. Let me come to the first part of your question, which I think is even more interesting. So uh, you commented about the possibility of uh, making drugs in this way for very many diseases and conditions. And I alluded to that briefly, but I'll expand on it in a, in a way which uh, I find really uh, very interesting and important. It, I, I spoke, I explained that most drugs are developed uh, for the purpose of inhibiting enzymes, which are the cause in mutated form of disease. Uh, it is estimated that uh, some 20% of all potential drug targets in the human body are accessible in that manner. It is estimated that some 80% of drug targets uh, cannot be addressed in this way. The reason is they do not work through or cannot be uh, in some way subject to interference by a small molecule. The only way that they can be uh, addressed is by preventing the interaction with a another large molecule, one enzyme interacting with another enzyme, one protein with another. I explained that in the case of the transcription machinery, the RNA polymerase is not one molecule. There are 60 proteins, every one of which is essential for the process. And they interact in a large assembly. 
if one could prevent one of them from interacting to form part of that assembly, you would block transcription. So 80% of potential drug targets are thought only to be accessible by interfering with interactions between protein molecules. But small molecules cannot achieve that purpose. Small molecules cannot prevent two large molecules from interacting with each other. However, a small piece of protein can do that. If we uh, discover, we know what is the uh, composition of the interface between the two, and we make a little piece of that interface, what's a peptide, it can be just a few dozen, two, 10, 20 protein building blocks, amino acids long, we can introduce, introduce that as a drug and that will interfere with the normal interaction. So the 80% of drugs, of, of targets that are inaccessible could be addressed not by small molecule drugs, not by DNA and RNA drugs, but by small protein peptide drugs. And we have shown that this cholesterol derivative readily facilitates the entry of peptides into cells. So it isn't only that we'll be able to make a small interfering RNA or an antisense DNA, as I told you, for addressing many disease conditions. We'll be able to make peptide drugs readily that will enable treatment of the 80% of drug targets that cannot be done today. All right, and professors, shall we move to the light, lighter issues? Because we would like to inspire the youngs to ask questions. You can ask any questions apart from the chemistry, probably like um, the experiences. How sure. many countries have your life? Uh, your life professors is been here. Scientists, the problems you face, and ask in the Thai language if you wish. Anything. So the youngs, so you can ask any questions. สามารถถามภาษาไทยได้นะคะถ้าเป็นถ้าเป็นคำถามอื่นค่ะจะพยายามแปลคำถามให้ professor นะคะมีคำถามไหมคะ Any questions from the young from from the floor over there over there Yes, please. The microphone, please. Sorry, I'll turn this on. Oops, that was a mistake. That was my wife. y a l l I'm still giving this lecture. Bye. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your valuable talks uh, today. Uh, my question is uh, not uh, related to your this uh, lecture, but uh, I want to ask uh, that uh, today we are uh, uh, hearing a lot about this artificial intelligence like AI. Uh, revolution is coming. So, what will be the role of this uh, artificial intelligence revolution in eradicating disease? And uh, do you see any future uh, uh, possibilities for uh, cutting edge technologies coming out uh, from this artificial intelligence? Thank you. So, if I don't know if everyone could hear the question. It is what about the role of machine learning or yeah. artificial intelligence in uh, the pharmacology of the future? And uh, the answer is uh, that it is of utmost importance. It will have a profound impact um, at many levels. So in regard to disease in the first place, just plain susceptibility to disease. You know that there are people who uh, prove to be naturally immune to many diseases, SARS-CoV-2, um, AIDS, very many other diseases. And uh, by analyzing human genomes, which we can do on a large scale with the use of artificial intelligence, we may discover what are the keys to natural immunity. Uh, but beyond that, even with existing methods, uh, analyzing uh, in, this, in a similar manner uh, response to drugs. We may be able to determine what is the best drug for an individual. Uh, once more, with the availability of the uh, 
genetic information from a large number of people, knowledge of their uh, response to a particular drug for cure of one or another illness. Uh, we can possibly target drugs more effectively uh, for people. But those are just uh, the most limited kinds of example. It goes far beyond because the, the challenge, as I have told you, is uh, not only the application of existing knowledge, uh, the, the, the challenge is, begins with the basic science and the, the problem of, or the challenge of discovery. Uh, in the past, and I think always in the future, um, discovery is a kind of a random process, which is to say, uh, you can't predict a discovery by its nature. So that's why I said the only thing you can do is gather knowledge, uh, prove one's understanding of nature, the world around us, and discoveries will emerge. Information will be discovered, will be found that turns out to be applicable to a problem of interest. Well, uh, the amount of information uh, that one needs to try and understand, as we do uh, when we perform what I call basic science, um, is growing all the time. And it's increasingly difficult uh, to benefit from the entire body of knowledge. Machine learning is uh, an important tool for giving clues, for helping to sift through a vast amount of information already available and much more that will be gathered uh, to try and elucidate the mechanisms of biological and other processes. Uh, there are very many other examples I could offer. One that I was going to present, but there just wasn't time in the lecture today. Uh, we can use a combination of basic physics and artificial intelligence to make new drugs, not through chemistry, but rather by computation alone. Often the molecules that are derived by the DNA encoded library approach that I did describe can be made much better, can be uh, improved, can be optimized by computation. The methods we have developed in recent years employ a combination of fundamental physics concerning the interaction of a drug with its target and artificial intelligence, uh, which serves actually to improve the accuracy of our computation very greatly. There are many, many ways in which AI will prove to be important. It is relevant today and increasingly important in the future. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I have another uh, just uh, related to this title of this lecture that uh, it sounds very good that world without a disease or end of disease without a disease. But uh, what will be the implication for uh, uh, humanity or human society as a whole without disease? This sounds very good. But what be the implications? because uh, the evolution says that survival of the fittest, but no, uh, the survival of those who having good medical access, medical care or good affordability like this. So what will be the implication of world without a disease ending a disease? For a you know, the, the, the purpose of, 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 of medicine and of the work that we do to try and advance medical care, is simply to alleviate human suffering, no more, no less. Uh, the ways in which the, the tools that we create, the procedures that we make possible are employed um, are the responsibility of society, of governments and of the people in general. So scientists, more broadly, more generally speaking, can discover something, but it's for uh, society to decide upon its use. We hope that when we discover, for example, 
a way of alleviating suffering from when any one of the many conditions that I alluded to and many more, the uh, societies will find ways of making those advances available very widely. Uh, but again, it's not our role to do that. Um, we can discover information, we can offer means, and then it is for people, for governments, for society in general, uh, to decide on the application. Thank you. Uh, there's a young man there. Uh, oh, there's a... Thank you so much. I, my question is actually different from this. <laughs> I want to ask what has been uh, the biggest challenge in your course of research? Then the second one will be the advice you are going to give to uh, the younger researchers. I don't see the question. I can't tell. Could you raise your hand? I don't know where. Okay. In the back. Yeah. Uh, okay. So please. Yeah. My question is, uh, what has been one of the biggest challenge in your course of uh, this research? when you started to this time, most of the challenges that you faced and how you handled it. Then my second question will be uh, the please, advice you are going please, to give. Please to... stop there because I oh. couldn't understand. Could you understand the question well? Tell me, please. Say, say it again. You're asking what was the greatest challenge in our work? Yes. In our work, yes. So let me answer that question first. Uh, so in the, in the work that I mentioned, uh, one during just that one part of my career concerned with the molecular basis of transcription, uh, there were uh, at least uh, three very great challenges, all equally uh, important obstacles to the work. Uh, the first and very great challenge was to gain entree to the problem, even to begin. Uh, we had to do what Buchner did for fermentation in the case of transcription. He broke open yeast cells and could observe the process of fermentation, and, and then, of course, try and discover the molecules responsible. We broke open yeast cells to, in the first place, observe the process of transcription, and then to discover the molecules responsible. Well, when we broke open yeast cells, there was no transcription. In fact, people all around the world tried to do that. They broke open yeast cells, and tried to detect transcription, and they were unsuccessful. So the first and perhaps most important uh, event in our work was solving that problem. Once we could obtain an extract from yeast that would perform transcription, then we could go on to discover the nearly 60 proteins I told you that were responsible. So the, again, that very initial success after our own many, many months extending to years of trying and those of people in dozens of laboratories around the world, that was a key first step. But there were other major obstacles. We wanted uh, to understand the control of the process, not just to observe transcription, but to see how it is regulated as I have told you by the molecular computer mediator to achieve cell differentiation and development. Well, that didn't happen either. We couldn't observe that process. And it took a very long time before we finally found how to make that happen in order to discover the molecular basis. I could go on, but these were major challenges. All right. Thank you. Uh, the final one will be uh, the advice you give to the younger ones, younger researchers that are coming up. Thank you.
more questions are allowed, please. If you have any other questions, there's a search. here who wanted to ask a question. Yeah. Right. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, could professor. you raise your hand, please? I'm sorry. Could you raise your hand? And yes, because Professor cannot say you. Could you stand up, please? Thank you. I'm sorry. Yes. Then uh, just the Professor can see you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you very much. Um, please, I would like to know um, um, why you settled for the SIRNA, um, which is also similar to the short hair in RNA that could also go through the same process, if you could elaborate on that for us. Right, so the reason for the choice of small interfering RNA is in the first place, because it is small. Uh, so we wanted the minimal size of RNA molecule that could serve as an effective therapeutic. Uh, there were really only two choices. One was small interfering RNA, and the other, a, an antisense molecule, such as I mentioned earlier. The preference for small interfering RNA is because of its effectiveness, the cellular machinery for the use of an siRNA to destroy a target viral genome is exceptional. So both the small size and the very high efficiency of the natural mechanism uh, it is the reason why there has been great interest in the use of small interfering RNA as therapeutics. There are companies that have been formed all around the world to do that, but they have been very, very limited. After more than 30 years, only five such drugs have ever been made, and they are only effective against targets in the liver. And that is because RNA can only be readily assimilated by the liver. Uh, and the advantage of the approach we've made, of course, we can deliver the RNA anywhere to any target for any purpose. And the example I gave is of respiratory disease. All right. Okay, the next question, yeah. please. Sorry, um, I would like to ask a follow-up question. Um, so I'm wondering if the interest in siRNA targeting virus molecule has been uh, of great interest before COVID era, or is it just happened that COVID emerged and then people are interested in a new type of therapy? So uh, small interfering RNA was discovered by people named Andrew Fire, who's a colleague of mine on the faculty at Stanford and a man named Craig Mello at the University of Massachusetts. And they won the Nobel Prize for that work in the same year as I won the Nobel Prize in chemistry. They won the prize in medicine or physiology in 2006. Uh, the uh, potential of small interfering RNA as a therapeutic was immediately apparent when they discovered small interfering RNA about 10 years earlier. And uh, the pursuit of small interfering RNA as a therapeutic uh, has been a very active area of investigation. As I mentioned to your uh, friend on the left, the only reason why it, it has not been successful uh, after all of this time, except in very limited cases, is simply the problem of penetration of cells, simply the problem of delivery, and uh, our contribution is to discover this derivative of cholesterol, which if attached, allows rapid and a very uh, efficient penetration of cells. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, Professor, for your um, inspiring lecture today. Um, I don't... Um, ask you about your research, but I would like to ask you about um, your life because you are surrounded by um, Nobel Prize laureate, for example, your father, and also you, I think you personally know um, Professor Watson and Crick who discovered the uh, DNA. I would like 
to know how you feel and uh, would that person or those person, those, those people uh, inspire you in any aspects? So indeed, my father won the Nobel Prize in medicine or physiology in 1959 when I was 12 years old. Uh, uh, Francis Crick was one of my teachers. Uh, and I, in, uh, my postdoctoral advisor, a man named Aaron Klug, won the Nobel Prize in chemistry. So I was exposed to these people. And uh, there is something to be said more generally from that I have gained from that experience, which I could recommend to any one of the young people here. I think that uh, science, like very many other subjects, um, can be studied by reading books and attending lectures. Uh, but it is learned in the most effective manner from association with other scientists. Um, I often say that, you know, I was forced to read and memorize information about science during the many course, during much of the coursework that uh, I did, especially in, at the university. But it was only when I started to practice science in the company of other scientists uh, that I became enthralled with it and knew I wanted to do it for the rest of my life. And my most important teacher was not a Nobel laureate. He was the, I think, the leading chemical physicist of the latter part of the 20th century. Uh, his not well known to people outside of chemical physics, uh, but, uh, and in fact, he wasn't even an experimental scientist. And I was doing experiments. I wanted to study a particular problem and he couldn't really help me. Uh, he once told me when I was struggling and I couldn't find a solution to a problem uh, at the laboratory bench, he said, you know, if this were a differential equation, I know many tricks to solve it. But he couldn't help me with my problem at the bench. And yet I would tell you that I learned more from him than any other scientist in my life just from being around him for many years, hearing the remarks he would make about science in general, about specific uh, scientific findings or questions or what have you from other people. Uh, it, the, that form of apprenticeship is the most important aspect of one's development as a scientist, or I imagine in very many other areas. So I would encourage young people not to be uh, discouraged by uh, the requirements placed upon them for rote learning or uh, uh, the experience of coursework alone, but to enjoy whatever opportunity presents itself uh, to spend time in the presence of a practicing scientist. And I can assure you that here at your university, there are many fine scientists and, and simply spending a part of your time in their company would have the same effect upon you as what I have just described from my own life. Thank you very much. That is very inspiring. Thank you. Thank you very much. And yes, one more question. Is the microphone, please? Good afternoon, Professor Karnberg. So it is such an honor for me to be here to hear the excellence of your explanation about the biomedicine in the human. So I think this question a little bit <laughs> so basic, especially for us, but I think this question is representative of the youngsters here as well. I've always wanted to watch like Asian people winning the Nobel Prize, but for the Southeast Asian people, 
I think there's none of Southeast Asian people to win the Nobel Prize. My first question is, do you think there is any possibility for us to be an Southeast Asian people to win the Nobel Prize? That's the first question. The second one is, what is the problem do you think for us as Southeast Asian researcher cannot be winning the Nobel Prize? Because every time that I waited for the YouTube channel uh, presenting about the Nobel Prize winners from the Sweden, I always <laughs> waited for the Southeast Asian to win the Nobel Prize, but there is no. So is there any advice for you to encourage the, the young researcher here, especially here in Thailand, maybe in the future, there will be any win the winner or Nobel Prize here from Thailand. So thank you very much. My voice is shaking now. I'm talking to the Nobel laureate. <laughs> thank so, you. So let me just first mention that there have been quite a number of extraordinary Asian scientists who have won Nobel Prizes, uh, especially Japanese scientists, uh, some Chinese scientists, uh, but there's a, a, there is an answer to your question, and it's just, and I think it's important to bear in mind. So experimental science and its theoretical counterpart, uh, for whatever reason, began in Europe about 500 years ago with Johannes Kepler uh, and uh, uh, his theory about planetary orbits and then the experimental measurements that were made at about that time, uh, which confirmed uh, what he had theorized. And the work which began with them uh, was sustained. And gradually a scientific establishment was built up and I often remind my colleagues that we uh, benefit, we, our own capacity, our own work, everything that we've done depends entirely on the foundation that was laid and then built upon over the years. So we start, I started in my own career uh, with the benefit of hundreds of years not only of discovery made before, but the approach to science, the way of asking questions, the approach, the ways of solving problems, which as I mentioned to the earlier questioner, you don't gain so much from reading and studying, but you gain uh, from uh, observing how other more senior scientists go about approach a problem, go about solving a problem. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, the, uh, the development of such a, uh, a scientific establishment began in, uh, in, in Asia in general, more recently. Uh, it has only been in the last certainly a hundred years, maybe the last 50 years, that there's really been a big investment that many people have uh, entered careers in science. And so it unavoidably takes time to reach the point where a sufficient number of people building upon uh, the achievements of the past uh, can break new ground and be candidates for high awards. Uh, I think it'd be fair to say probably most of the uh, creation of such a scientific establishment in many countries in the Asian region um, dates back not more than a hundred years and in many cases less. So you can't really expect there to be such a large number of people already working at that level and it's a numbers game. It's a numbers game. There are many, many scientists who've done great work who are worthy of a Nobel Prize. 
thousands in the United States and in Western Europe. And so there are simply many more to choose from in making the award. Someday there will be as many in Asian countries. And then there will be an equal number of Nobel Prizes awarded to Asian scientists. It's as simple as that. Just as simple as that. There's no other reason. There's no impediment. I mean, you know, uh, the last thing I might point out to you is that much of the work uh, that was done in my laboratory and that of many others uh, that led to discoveries uh, rewarded with uh, the highest honors, including the Nobel Prize, was done by young Asian students. Uh, I've had superb Japanese, Chinese, Korean, Indian, and other students. Uh, they have gone back in some cases uh, to their home countries, and they're doing research today, which may one day, in some case, I hope, uh, uh, reach the level and achieve the recognition of a Nobel Prize. So you, you shouldn't feel in the least deterred. On the contrary, you're living in the best possible time because at this university and others today, uh, the uh, knowledge, the expertise, the experience exists for the first time in Asia. And you have as great an opportunity and a possibility of discovering something that will lead to a high award as any young person anywhere else in the world. Thank you so much for the answer. You might have a <laughs> Yeah, it always happens. So right after this, you are invited to take photos with professors and probably you can ask him more questions if you would like to. But right after his lecture, and of course, right after this part, because we would like to express our sincere gratitude to you know, your lecture. So may I invite the president of CMU of Chiang Mai University to present the token of appreciation to our keynote speakers today. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is such a wonderful moment. The Super Bowl is indeed, you know, Chiang Mai's uh, signature token of appreciation. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so very much. Appreciate it. And of course, uh, we have more, right? Oh my. Two pieces, not just one. And yes, this is <laughs> our cross bag. <laughs> Beautiful. Take it home. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so very much, professors and our, and the president. Ladies and gentlemen, actually, we come to the very end of the lecture. And like I have told you before, you are invited to take photos with the professors. You can ask him you know, the question apart from his research and anything. But firstly, please let us know your comments. Uh, the QR code, please. The QR code. <laughs> yes, uh, we would love to know your comments. And of course, it would help us, you know, improve our event in, in the future. And of course, your comments will be very valuable for us. And right after this, professors will... Oh, okay. So this is um, the first guest <laughs> who will have the individual photo with 
our professor. Mm -hmm. And of course, everyone too, you are invited to take photo with professor outside. You know, we have very beautiful backdrop there. And let me inform you one more thing. This is a very surprising because, shall we do it now? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, the ones who are here today, it's very lucky. Please check and look for the coupon under your seat. If you find one, if you found it, yes, you'll get the prize from us. <laughs> come on, come on. <laughs> yeah, you can find the coupon under your seat. And of course, the available other free seat you can you, you can take yours. <laughs> and of course, if you find one, you will find CMU sticker, and you will see what you can exchange for your price at the registration desk at registration desk. Okay. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the very end of our special lecture. Thank you very much for your presence. So please enjoy your day and thank you very much. มีประกาศนะคะนักศึกษากยศนะคะนักศึกษากยศช่วยสแกนนะคะนักศึกษากยศนะคะกรุณาไปที่โต๊ะลงทะเบียนแล้วก็ไปสแกน QR Code เพื่อจะเก็บแต้มนะคะไม่สแกนช่วยไม่ได้ค่ะ